Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Littlejohn with Nancy Littlejohn Fine Art in Houston, Texas. We're here today to talk with the artist Peter Coyne on the occasion of her first solo exhibition at the gallery, A Silver Pied Peacock. So I would like to thank you so much for being here with us, Peta. And I want to read a little bit of her bio, which of course is quite impressive and I don't want to miss anything, so I'm going to wear my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peta Coyne is a contemporary sculptor and photographer, best known for her large and small scale hanging sculptures and floor installations. Working in innovative and desperate materials, her media has ranged from the organic to the ephemeral, from incorporating dead fish, mud, sticks, hay, black sand, specifically formulated in patent wax, satin ribbons, silk flowers, to more recently glass, velvet, taxidermy, and cast wax statuary. Unafraid to confront a range of subjects or tackle contemporary themes, Coyne's innate dualities are transported or transposed in dichotomous themes of her work, transformation and constancy, life and loss, beauty and darkness. Her work is in numerous permanent museum collections, including, of course, the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Guggenheim, the Whitney, the Brooklyn Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, San Francisco, MOBA, Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden, the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. What else? My goodness, amongst others. Uh, Peta currently lives in New York and is represented by Gallery Lelong, Nunu Fine Art in Taiwan, and of course, Nancy Littlejohn Fine Art. So we're gonna start with some Fun questions, we're gonna just dive right in. So, um, Peta, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you grew up? Oh, that's, that's always about that? easy <laughs> and fun. Um, I was raised um, by um, uh, two very individual people. Um, they were, uh, they thought out of the box more than anything else. My father was in the military, so we moved all over the world. Uh, we, and when you're young, you think what you do, everyone else does. And uh, we moved 15 times before I was even 12. And my mother always wanted us to be wherever there was anything exciting going on. So she would grab us and take us out of school at the drop of a hat. And um, this was not popular with any of my teachers, but was very popular with all my school friends. And um, she also had what was called free days. And she would wake us up really early, I mean extra early. And she would say, now today is a free day. And she said, what do you want to do with your free day? And we'd be like, oh, wonderful. I had a math test today. Great. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much fun. And we'd say, let's go ride bikes or let's go to the park. And my mother would go, my children would do something so mundane as riding bikes or going to the parks. And we'd be like, oh God, we're gonna lose our free day. And my <laughs> older brother would be like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. We will build the city of Babylon in the backyard. <laughs> From my mother would be like, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And we ended doing things like that or painting you know, the Sistine Chapel on the ceiling. You know, we did such fun things, you know, while all my classmates were taking tests or studying, you know. But she felt we would learn so many more things than just doing those things, you know. So am I allowed to share that your father was a general? Yes. That's kind of notable. But, yes. Right. <laughs> Very serious. But he actually was much more at home. My mother was really the general, and <laughs> my father had the big soft heart, you know. So, and that. as is with any Irish family. Right. Yes. Oh my gosh. So, tell us how you ended up in New York. 
Um, you know, uh, I went to art school down in Cincinnati, a very, very traditional school. And then as soon as um, I graduated, I went home and got married and married my childhood sweetheart uh, that I met at age 13, fell madly in love with. And um, then I went to a lecture of, of uh, three wonderful women artists that were in Dayton for a Dayton Beautiful Council. And it was Jody Pinto and Alice Acock and Donna Dennis. And they came and they talked about things I had never heard of before, never. They were digging holes in abandoned parking lots and dropping red paint in them and talking about rape and murder. And Alice Acock was building these low houses to the ground that you had to crawl in like combat mm -hmm. and your face was to mud, you know, and she was talking about like burial grounds and death and Donna Dennis was building these beautiful two-third houses, you know, that you that you stayed in when you were, um, you know, uh, going on summer vacations and I knew nothing of this, you know, I'd been raised to make figures like Degas and drawings mm -hmm. and and I was like this is my medium sculpture how do I not know this stuff Amazing. and I had to go to New York I, so my husband was in graduate school okay. so I said to him that afternoon I, I really have to go to New York you finish graduate school come join me when you're finished and he was like you're not leaving me here in Dayton, are you? And I said, just till I, just come when you're finished. And he said, no, I'm going with you. So we sold everything we had and we borrowed my parents' station wagon and we drove to New York and my brother had just finished Columbia graduate school and we knocked on his door and we said, we're here. And he was like, here, like here, here. <laughs> and like any good brother, he welcomed us in. And we Amazing. lived in Tribeca, which wow. at that point in 77, there was nothing, you know. Wow. He had 5,000 square feet. He was there with 15 other artists. Wow. And we just moved in. And um, that's living the life. That is it. That was it. So uh, that was our, and we loved it. We loved it from the minute we got there. Exactly. And we found a loft three months later, and that's where we've lived ever since. Amazing. In that loft. So um, let's talk a little bit about the materials and maybe how some of these women, as you said, influenced your way of looking at things so much. So why don't we talk a little bit about that? You know, I've, I've found that women... Um, make sculpture very differently, or at least they did in the beginning, than men. They brought all kinds of materials to that that were so untraditional. And maybe it came from the home or the mm -hmm. house. You know, they brought everything. Just anything would work. And nobody was paying attention to women in sculpture at all, mm -hmm. at all. Nobody was showing women at that time. So it just didn't matter what we did. So we were free in a way, which was kind of wonderful. We could do anything. And um, so that was totally freeing. And I remember reading a lot of Saul LeWitt, Rauschenberg, all Donald Judd's writings. I read Lucy Lepard's book about wow. Eva Hesse, which just opened a world. Mm -hmm. And if you've not read that book, it's such a great thing. And the correspondence between Eva Hesse and Saul LeWitt mm -hmm. is spectacular. Mm -hmm. And all his writings that he did to her when she was in Germany are just amazing and I still reread them on occasion because you know he said to her just you know just paint 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 do sculpture just fill your heart with it you know and I can't use some of the words that he said to her but you know they're in my head you know it's not ladylike <laughs> that I want on film but um but you can imagine what he said and I thought they were totally great and Rauschenberg said if you are in a lot if you're in the street and you walk around the block and you don't find materials to make sculpture with you're not looking hard enough yeah. and I thought that was so wonderful and I would walk home from work every day and I would go and I'd see all the fish in Chinatown and I thought, they're so interesting. I should just make 
work from the fish because right. that's what I loved and I, that's what I saw. And so it was all there. So can you tell us a little bit, we're gonna kind of go back a little bit to her first exhibit or installation in Houston in the 80s where she used those fish, yeah. right? Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Kind of brings you into the history of Houston? Yes, okay. I, I did. I collected fish uh, for five years. I collected them. I was like an alcoholic. You know, I would get <laughs> paid on Friday from Chanel, no less, right? right? And I just loved these fish, and I kept hanging them in my loft, and I painted the walls black, and I covered the windows with black plastic, and I had... Oh, 5,000, 6,000 dead fish. They were so beautiful, I thought, right? I thought they were glorious. And my neighbors kind of thought they were beautiful. They, they, they really liked me, and they would knock on the door every now and again. Even the kids in the hallway would knock on the door and let their friends stand there, and I'd open the door, and they'd go, see, I told you. And the friends would be like, whoa, you know? And... Um, but eventually my husband started to get eye infections, right? And so we knew we had to get rid of them. Okay. So we started doing public projects and fish is the symbol of Christ. And so for Houston, I, I had tried to get Atlanta to build this project, but they wouldn't. And it was a very ambitious project, right? And so I thought, well, how beautiful to build a nun on a highway, right? And Houston said they would do it. And I thought, wow, they're so progressive in Houston, right? And so I did this nun on the highway that was built on, uh, it was called a, the Bayou Project. And they chose, I think, 10 artists from across America. And, um, and, uh, and Martin Perrier was one of the judges. There were three judges. I'm sorry, I can't remember the other ones. Martin was so, Amazing. I was so thrilled. And so there were three lanes going this way and three lanes going this way and it was on a curve and we chose it very carefully so at night when your lights were on it looked like you were going to just drive and here's this big 15 foot 24 foot wide nun right <laughs> and that's how i used to see the nuns they were so big and all right, powerful right, right? right. Yes. and you're driving up and you're gonna run this nun down, right? And I'm thinking, oh my God. And then you drive right around her, right? And so on the back side is a, is a mummy of a nun, right? And the same thing on the other side. Now people in this park could open the doors and that would give her black wings, right? And then you question, does a nun go to heaven or does she go to the other place, right? And on, when you opened her up, you saw 1,200 dead fish and hay <laughs> filled with it. And the reason is because the nuns told us when they died, if you're ever with a nun when she dies, it is magical because the light that leaves us is so bright, it blinds everybody, everybody in the room. It just blinds you. And I thought, I have to become a nun just to see that happen. I mean, that is amazing, totally amazing. But as I got a little older, I began to wonder, does that really happen? Because all these nuns aren't quite so nice. I'm not so sure, right? So you could climb up the middle of the nun and look out her eyes and see all the cars coming for you, right? And I wanted to warn the people that we're thinking about becoming nuns, maybe it's not such a good profession, right? <laughs> and also, it was built at an angle that the car fumes would also go up there, so you got a little sick if you stood there too long, right? But the nuns, my dad said this would backfire on me, right? And the nuns contacted me from the Sacred Heart Convent, and they said they'd really like to have this nun in their convent after, because we were all temporary convent after I pa you know, after I passed away, after the nun passed away, or it was going to be taken down. And I felt so guilty, and I said, "Oh yes, sister, of course you can take this back to your convent." And I said, "I'd even help you move it, but I can't afford to move it myself because it was built and." So I would never have been able to 
really build this whole thing if it hadn't been so generously helped by this by Kirby. wonderful man, yeah. which not only housed us, but found builders to help us build it and everything, right? And so um, in the end, the nuns came. They couldn't afford to move it. So they, what they did was they brought a chainsaw and um, we have pictures of the nuns all standing there. And um, they took this chainsaw and they cut her head off, just the top part of it, cut the head off of the nun, and they took the head and put it on the top of their station wagon and moved it back to the convent, right? And then the, bo then the body was uh, taken and put in the dumpster, I'm afraid. So that was the end, and that was in 1985 here Amazing. in Houston. Amazing. And the last time I did a big project. I'm glad this one's a little safer here. In, <laughs> well, in, not, not exactly, because of the um, materials used. If you look around, you can see that she uses lots of different materials, and that's one of the first things people ask what is this? Some people think is that glass or those flowers or ribbons, but in fact it's wax. So why don't you talk to us about how you came about this material? Why wax? Well, I always loved wax, um, but when I went to Rome, I was in a, um, a residency in France, and I went down to Rome, and I had a wonderful friend down there who was Canadian, and she was married to an Italian, and she wasn't having any shows. And I said, oh, you got all these big churches around you. Just go in there, pray a little bit, light a candle, drop a few coins in the box. You can get so many, so many shows. And she's like, Peter, I don't believe in that stuff. I said, no, come with me. We'll do it. So she went to three churches with me, and she said, I'm going home. This is not going to work for me. I said, I'll do it. So the rest of the day, I went to all these churches, lit all these candles, did some prayers, looked at the beautiful churches, did it all. I must have done 20, I think I did 27, candle, 27 candles for her in churches. And then I left, and I wrote her a note and said how many I'd done. And then I went back to France, and then I went back to the United States. And when I got back there, she had sent me a box of candles blessed by the Pope and said that she had so many exhibitions, so many shows, she could not handle the pressure. She'd lost 30 pounds. Please, light these candles, blow them out. She could not take any more success, right? Oh She'd done God. it. So I, may, I decided to make a hat for her for her show in New York. So I was making this hat with all these candles, blessed by the Pope, with all the glue guns and everything. And I invited a friend of mine who's a dancer. Come on over. Try this thing on. Let's do a dance with it. I'll film you. <laughs> And so she did. We lit the thing. She's in the hat. The moment I started to light everything, the whole thing combusted because of the hot glue gun. It just combusted immediately. And I like to have died. Like I'm thinking, oh my God. You know, because Irene is a good friend of mine. And I'm thinking, oh geez. Like, her husband, and I'm running for, you know how everything slows down when you're like in this terrible moment? I'm running for the fire extinguisher, and I'm thinking, her husband, does she have children? Do I have to raise them? And I'm like getting it, and I'm spraying the fire extinguisher, and she's coming out of the hat, and she's going like, don't you dare spray me with that stuff. And I can see her eyebrows are singed, and you know, and I'm like, and she's going, no, and I'm like spraying and like, you know, this whole mess. And, and, and I'm thinking, oh gosh. And so we get it all. And she turns to me and I'm thinking she's going to just curse me up a blue streak. And so she turns and she says to me, God, how did it look? Shall we do it again? And I'm like, have you lost your mind? And she, of course, she's a performance artist too, wow. and she's a great choreographer. And I, I'm like, let me work out some kinks first, Duran, and then I'll get back to you. And we did eventually do this big performance and everything at this museum. But I'll tell you, I didn't wear the hat to the to the 
one person show, but it did start me on all these pieces. And I, cause I did think they looked glorious, but I went back to my contacts at Chanel and the woman, the man who made all the lipstick. And I said, I have some problems with this. I need help. And right. so we began this long process of these patents and making sure that they would go up to 220 before they even melted right. and no fires, you know, like all this stuff. And they have one nemesis. They don't like cold. And when I say yeah. cold, I mean freezing cold. So we have different, we have three formulas. We have the chandelier, we have a floor formula, and we have a wall formula. Okay. So, yeah, so that's how it all started. Fascinating. So I will say that lighting the candles in the churches must work because at the last Venice Biennale, Margot Sawyer was with us, with Emily and I, and um, Peta asked us to light candles for her when we were in the churches. So we did, and maybe that's why you're here today doing this i'm sure it is right i'm Something sure to it do. is my yes. goodness so um let's talk more about the sculpture but i think everyone would like to know do you start with drawings before you dive into these do you draw oh i wish i did i was just talking to someone who does really do all their drawings before and plan. I plan nothing. Okay. I work from just emotion or okay. feeling. Yeah, I wish I did. No. What about um, the works hanging from the ceiling? Why do you choose to hang them like chandeliers or something fine? I'm so glad you asked that. I mean, not many people ask me that, and that's always my normal stance. It feels so normal to me, and and maybe because I have such a bad case of dyslexia, you know, it's always just, oh, it feels so good. It feels like breathing to me. And they are so vulnerable. And maybe because that vulnerability opens us up to other people. Mm -hmm. You know, when you meet someone, you can either open up or you can close down. And if you open up, I find that people also open up to you. And so the pieces are very vulnerable, so they're open to other people. And I hope that opens them up to what the work is about. So um, that's, that's why I always hang, but it is a very vulnerable stance. Very vulnerable. Yeah. So what about like with this piece, the Jane Austen behind us, for example, there's a whole other world inside of her. Yes. So I'm assuming that's Intentional. I mean, it could be like petticoats and you can't see what's underneath, but you know there's something powerful and strong happening. Yes, right? yes, yes. And I, and I think that's also why I put the floor elements on the floor, not only because it looks, it grounds the piece, but it makes it so that you move very carefully and you can look, but only from a certain distance looking up. And I think that's, that's very, because I don't want people to get, I want people to be very respectful and very, um, very cautious around the piece because they are very fragile, but they also very tough. Um, uh, to destroy them is really hard. Um, uh, so, but they are fragile. They do break. You know, if you took a sledgehammer to them, they would break. But what artwork wouldn't right. if you took a sledgehammer right. to it? So talking about this can be interpreted a lot of different ways. Let's just say a ball skirt or, you know, incredible chandelier. How does your, um, how does couture influence your work? Because she did work for Chanel as a young person, and I feel like it's infused in the work, but I want to know what you think. Oh, definitely. I think, yes, that, that world was so beautiful to me. But even when I was in high school, I remember I was the only one that wore black to all the dances. And, and my dad was like, why black, Peta? You know, all the young girls wear blues and pinks. And, and not that I didn't have some, but I loved the black. It just seemed so elegant to me. But in Dayton, Ohio, it, it just wasn't the thing. You know, it just, and, um, but I thought it was so beautiful. And, um, but still, when I began at Chanel, the women, as I told you, said, you know, I had 
uh, tomatoes in my pockets and corn in my shoes, you know, and they were going to show me how to dress and wear makeup and everything of that nature. And they did. And so I do know how, but um, I prefer, prefer none. And um, it's, uh, it's, it is, I do love it. I think it's beautiful. I, but I think this, this uh, peacock is as beautiful as couture. I think she's, I always think she's a she. She's, she's gone through some transformations. And, um, and I just think she's just got the most gorgeous, you know, she's a cross between a blue and a white. And I just think she's so magnificent. She is couture to me. And, um, and, and couture uses feathers and everything else. So I think there can't be anything more magnificent. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So the name of the exhibition is a silver pied peacock. So tell us, what, what is that? Yeah, it is a cross between a blue and, and a white. Okay. And they just recently crossed these, I think in the last, well, I don't know when exactly it was, but I only learned of it uh, like in 2000. And, um, and I have to wait for these birds to die. And luckily, if they die in January or August with full plumage on, then I get to have them. Um, and she, I waited 11 years for her to die. And so, um, and not that you wish for anything to die, but I did sort of wish when she, you know, I was kind of like hoping. And um, for 11 would, years, <laughs> for 11 years, I was like, I would call the guy up, how's, how's he doing? Oh, he looks healthy, Peter. I'd say, well, that's great news. <laughs> and every year, Christmas time, how's he doing? Looks good, Peter. Well, good. You know? <laughs> and so, and I said, and then when he was starting to slow down, I said, make sure he slows only in January or August, you know, because you don't want him to die those other months because you've been waiting so long. Oh but God bless him. Thank you. <laughs> he seemed to know when I wanted him to go. So, um, so, but they, they just are so remarkable. They are. And, remarkable. and he's at a farm where there's 2,000 of them. Can uh -huh. you imagine of white and blue? Yeah. There, are, yeah. there aren't very many silver ones there. So incredible. I just think they're incredible, just incredible. So, so anyway. Well, I think um, just relating to the works, um, if you look at the titles, you can tell, I think, that Peter is a voracious reader. So why don't you tell us about how some of these themes from literature work their way into your work? Yeah, I, I do love to read. I, and probably because I'm such a slow reader um, that I really, really love to read. But now that there's audiobooks, I can really go through two or three books a week, and I love them. And, um, and I often go back and read a book couple times because you miss a lot you know and um, and the characters in the books are in my head and they're all wandering around so they all talk to each other all different characters from different books which is so much fun you know and they're all in there and I and the more you read the more the characters interact and from some of the films you know and so I never plan that this would be about this particular book. And the office, like Jessica and everybody, so what's the name of this piece? Oh, well, it's this, you know, and then I'm working on it just because they need it for the files. Mm -hmm. And then it's this, and then it's this. And sometimes it's not till a year afterwards, oh, this is what it's about. Okay. I can see more clearly. Okay. Because the piece really informs me. I, I don't plan it it comes out, it just comes naturally. I'm just working through, it kind of, it's almost like you're working and you go into this other place and it just all comes. And it's like you have your materials out there and it's almost like, I feel sometimes they don't need me. If right. I could just go to sleep, they would just make themselves, Amazing. you know? So it's, you go to a different space. Yeah. What about um, the use of the female protagonist? How does she work her way in? Yes, I think because 
because I'm a woman, I'm so sensitive to all the positions that women are in, all the places, how women have struggled. When I was a young woman, there were, how many women owned their companies? I don't think, what, almost Not none? Really. You know, and if they did, boy, did they struggle. And even today, how many did? I mean, even at the opening last night, that one gentleman that we were talking to, and I introduced you and said you were you own this company, and he said, "Pardon me," and I said, "Yes, Nancy owns this company. This one, she owns this gallery." Kind of, he almost yeah, couldn't true. quite believe it. And this is like 2021, and so it's interesting that. You know, we still struggle. People still don't quite believe that women have a place. And so I'm very sensitive about these issues, you know. And and you look at the top, top galleries, you look at the at the auction results, how many women are in the are in the top thing? Right. And and they did that survey of how many women are in the top museums and how many women are even bought by them. It's, it is sad. It's sad and it's pathetic and it's awful. It's awful. It's awful. So, okay, we're not going to get bitter. We're not going to get sad. We're not going to get all those things. We're just going to keep being there. We're just going to keep doing work and eventually we'll get our place. Yeah. That's how it'll be. Exactly. So they're all there. I'm very sensitive to them and I feel them.